Hi everybody, I'm Gio. Welcome to my channel. I write gay fiction for fun. I hope you enjoy. Time to start another book. I think this one's our fifth. This one is called Speeding. As always, any background noises, that's my little dog. She is rather active today. Let's get started. Chapter 1 Tuesday, August 2nd Pete I staggered to my apartment around 11. Drunk. I hope I had parked where I was supposed to. I hate this place. I hate my life. I hate my job. I had been living here for two years, thinking living on my own would make my life better. It only got worse. I'm Peter Stone, 22. Six feet, brunette, and brown eyes. Everybody thought I had it all. Nice clothes, always put together, lots of friends, and a great family, as long as I didn't have to see them. I have a brother a few years younger than me, a dad who thought he did enough by working all day long, and a mom who was always right and had to have her way in everything. I had my own place, so I would never have to move back home again. I should be the happiest person in Dead Man's Butte. That's the official name of the small town dump I live in. Everybody just calls it the Butte. We're only an hour north of Vegas, unless my best friend, Ethan, drives. Then it's an hour and a half. He's an ambulance driver, so you'd think he'd be crazy. But get him out of the ambulance, and he travels five minutes below the speed limit. I couldn't decide whether tonight was a night to celebrate or a night to get depressed. It didn't matter anymore. The good thing about today, I'd made employee of the month and got a $50 bonus, a cake, a surprise party, and the coveted Comet trophy to sit on my desk for a month. If I could find a spot, the trophy would get lost in the mess on my desk by tomorrow. The bad thing about today, Mom called and set me up on a date Saturday night without even asking. She's only a few years older than you, but I'm sure you like her. My apartment complex had bright lights everywhere. Management didn't want to get sued for there not being enough security lights, especially around the pool. I liked the lights. It helped me find my apartment as I staggered from my car to my front door. My complex was a two-story strip of apartments all in a row. I had the bottom end all to myself, which also meant I had the end of the row covered parking. Easy to find, even when I've had one or two too many. I fumbled in my pocket for my keys and removed them with a slight tremble to my hand. Okay, maybe it was three or four drinks too many. I think I was at my door. It looked like the right one. Where was my lock? Somebody had taped an envelope on my door, and it covered the lock. I removed it and squinted to try and keep the letters still enough to read. From the management of Mojave Sands Apartments to Peter Stone. Third notice. Action required. I drank so much I couldn't concentrate. It's probably not that important. I'd read it tomorrow when I sobered up. I let myself in not turning the lights on, and dropping the paper on some stack somewhere before I dropped on the couch and fell asleep. 6 a.m. The alarm on my phone ripped through the ache in my head. Where's the aspirin? A dim light edged through the blinds I hadn't opened since last. Christmas? Or was it the Christmas before last? How much extra did I have to drink last night? Five or six drinks? My head felt like it must have been ten or twelve. Time to get ready for work. All I wanted to do was melt into the ground so no one would ever find me. They wouldn't in this mess. Welcome to my treasure trove. My nest is the couch under the front room window and the small table in front of it. The piles of papers, clothes, old pizza boxes, old boxes stuffed with who knew what, garbage bags filled with forgotten treasures, blocked most of the light coming in. My possessions surrounded me. They possessed me. 
They depressed me, and I did not want to get up. I lay on the couch in my living room, ignoring last night's takeout dinner as it rotted on the coffee table in front of me. It wasn't last night, because I had gone out. Maybe it was from last weekend? How much had I drunk last night? My head pounded, and I had the worst taste in my mouth. My vision blurred. I slept in yesterday's clothes. I stunk of stale sweat and stale Kung Pao beef and stale beer. Somewhere I had aspirin, if I could remember where, or even find it. As I stripped and threaded my way along the narrow path to the bathroom, I dropped my clothes with all the others on the floor. The air smelled damp, a little more moldy, and very musty. Slipping on a paper, I steadied myself against a column of old, sagging boxes, one of dozens of columns, and fought a wave of nausea. The column of boxes wobbled, and I eased off of it. I didn't need it falling again, but it had other ideas. Over it went, hitting an old picture I'd found on the side of the road and my dusty collection of beer steins. The sound of breaking glass disturbed me. Bare feet and broken glass make a bad combination. I'll deal with it later, after the headache goes away. Where did I put the aspirin? I stepped onto a wet patch in the clothes. Had I spilled something? I must have thrown up last night and never realized it. Maybe it was time to limit myself to two or three drinks a night. I made my way to the fridge and opened it. There must be something to eat here. A fresh whiff of something rotting stank the air. No food in there. I slammed it shut. I'll clean it tonight. I turned around, not daring to look at the mountain of plates and glasses and old containers and a shirt and two garbage bags filled with last week's garbage on the kitchen counter. More garbage bags sat on the floor. Were those from two weeks ago? They had spilled open and had a couple of holes in the bottom. Something had gotten into them. I'll take care of them tonight. First a shower, then I'll find clean-smelling clothes, then find a cheap place to eat. Nothing here is edible. I found the bathroom, but I had to move a couple of boxes to open the door. My electric razor was old and barely worked, but I knew where it was, lost in the mess of the bathroom counter. My bathroom smelled of spilled shampoo and mold and rotted food. Did I bring takeout in here again and forgot about it? The razor was easy to find. I followed one of the cords from the outlet, and there it was. How did my life get like this? I don't know anymore. Last weekend, Dad wouldn't stop pushing me to get married. So what? You were dumped. At your age, you should date at least every week, sometimes twice. I dated a different girl all the time until I eventually met your mom. Of course I lied. I met a cute redhead last week, and we're going out on Saturday. See, Roy, dating's not that hard. Roy's my younger brother, 17, a senior, on the track team, and not a gamer geek like me. To use the toilet, I have to move two boxes off the lid and into the bathtub, then move them back to use the shower. I don't think I've ever cleaned the toilet. It looks like it, and smells like it, too. It took me a minute to find my toothbrush, but I gave up on finding the toothpaste. At least my teeth feel clean. The clothes I use are in three piles. The ones I liked that need to be washed, and the ones I like that I washed last weekend, and the ones I walk on. As I dressed by the couch in the living room, the only place that has room for me to get dressed, I stared at the envelope that vandalized my door last night. It's probably the management wanting to resurface the parking lot. I opened it. Third notice. I appreciate that your rent has always been on time, but once again our maintenance personnel were unable to change filters and perform other basic tasks. Neighbors have complained about the smell, the mice, and the cockroaches coming from your apartment. I toured your apartment earlier today, or as much as I could, and your unit has become a safety hazard. I brought in an exterminator, and they said they saw signs of mice and suspect a cockroach infestation. Your unit needs to be cleaned out before they can get to work. The fire marshal came by to check on some things, and I had him look into your apartment. 
in addition to the other problems, he considers it a fire risk. I have asked you in the previous notices to come and see me so we can work with a mediator to solve the issues between us. You have not responded, so I can only assume that you have declined my help. I am sorry to say, because of these concerns, you will be evicted on August 31st if your apartment continues to remain in its current state. I will return for further inspections on August 10th, 20th, and the 30th to determine if you have cleaned your unit enough to warrant staying with us or if I have to contact our lawyer and begin eviction procedures. Please note, if evicted, you will not get your deposit back, and if we need to call a cleanup company to make your unit rentable again, we will sue you for the costs of the cleanup company, of restoring your unit to prime condition, and for legal fees. Sincerely, Linda, Management of Mojave Sands Apartments. I had mice crawling all over my stuff. They had gotten in the garbage. The neighbors had complained because of the smell. What smell? People had been in here? My landlord, the fire marshal, the exterminator? Who else had come into my apartment? They had seen how I lived? Wait. This was the third notice? What happened to the other two? My stomach heaved. My life that couldn't get worse just did. I scrambled through the unopened mail and papers by the door. One envelope was from the management and dated a month ago. I opened it and read something very similar to the other. The basic message was clear. Clean up or we kick you out. I'm only 22, been on my own for two years, and look at the mess I've made of my life. My parents haven't been inside my place for a year. No one has, except my landlord, maintenance, and exterminator, and probably their lawyer taking pictures for an eventual case against me. The heat flooded to my cheeks, and my eyes stung with a sudden wetness. I'm about to lose my apartment. Would I have to move home? What am I going to do? I needed help. I fell to the couch, fighting the overwhelming shame gouging my guts out. Something has to change, but I don't know what. My phone buzzed. A text. Ethan, my best friend since we were seniors at Montgomery Memorial High. I have never been brave enough to show him this place. None of my friends had seen it. Got something important I want to tell you. Can I come over tonight and talk to you? Six okay? That's right. It was Ethan's oft shift day. There was no way I am letting Ethan in here or anybody. I texted back. How about dinner at Arnold's Broiler and Pub at 6? I had finished dressing when Ethan returned my text. I'm on shift tomorrow, so we can't be too late. See you then. That could have been a crisis. Ethan had helped me move in two years ago, and just like my family, I don't let anybody in. At least I have something to look forward to. At least for today. It's close to 7.30 by the time I get my morning routine done and head out to find breakfast. Thank goodness, the front seats in my car are still empty. But don't look under the blanket in the back seat. And I'm definitely not popping the trunk for anyone. I'm not moving back with my family. I left there for a reason. 28 days until I'm on the streets. What am I going to do? Wednesday, August 3rd, Ethan. I can't believe how nervous I am. Tonight, I risked everything. I would have preferred telling Pete privately, but that wasn't an option. I sat in my car, dusting the dashboard even though I had dusted it earlier. I had to keep my hands moving because if they stopped, my mind started to freak out. Pete would be here any minute. I'm Ethan Sandoval, five foot ten, sandy blonde hair, and gray eyes. I have a tattoo just above my right shoulder blade of a hummingbird flitting about a flower intertwined about my arm. It's intricate, it's in color, and took four two-hour sessions, and six months later, another two-hour session to touch it up. I saw a psychic once, and she told me my spirit animal was a hummingbird. They travel fast and light and bring joy to everyone who sees them. That's me. I drive an ambulance, so I have to drive fast sometimes and I always travel light. I'm still working on the joy part. I'm also an only child. My parents are in the process of splitting up and it's getting ugly. 
I checked the rearview mirror for the tenth time to make sure my hair was in place, that I hadn't grown a zit in the last five minutes, and that I had nothing stuck in my teeth. Was my breath all right? I popped a breath mint, just to be safe. My car shined. I had hand-washed it, waxed it, vacuumed it, dusted it, made sure the windows were spotless, and refolded the blanket in the trunk. None of that mattered. I was still nervous. I checked my watch. Five minutes to go. It was about time I told Pete the truth about me, about us. How would he take it? We would still be friends, right? It wouldn't change anything, right? We'd known each other for years, and this wouldn't change anything, right? He was my best friend. So why did I feel like I wanted to throw up? Why did my armpits feel so wet? Because it was time to tell him the truth. I was terrified to death, and I couldn't stop polishing the dashboard. A dusty green Mazda pulled into the parking lot. Pete's. I was suddenly breathing too fast, and my leg shook. Here goes. Climbing out of my car into the Nevada late afternoon heat, I beeped my car and glanced at my reflection in the window. My hair was still in place, and no zits had popped up. Ethan, I said to myself, it's going to be fine. Stop worrying. Pete will still be your best friend. He'll get a good laugh out of it, and then life will go back to normal. I'm an ambulance driver. I deal with high-stress situations all the time, life and death ones even. I've assisted the paramedics on some pretty gruesome cases, so why did one little conversation scare me so bad? Arnold's Broiler and Pub was very familiar to me. I came here at least once a week, not to drink, but usually to pick somebody up and take them to the hospital. I knew all the bars in town, and not in a good way. Last week, we received a call from the paramedics about an unresponsive lady who was so drunk she passed out, hit her head, and nearly died. Severe alcohol poisoning. Arnold's was kind of plain on the outside. A sign above the door said, We serve steaks the way they should be cooked. It had a green door and a large window with a sign on it. Welcome to Arnold's Broiler and Pub. Inside, it was completely different. Wood-paneled walls, an electric yellow jukebox, and usually a live band on the weekend. What made them unique? Arnold's was also a microbrewery. He made his own beer. Pete held the door for me and we went inside. We took a seat and we each got a beer and ordered. I usually could relax here, but not tonight. The sooner I told Pete, the sooner I could relax. How was work? I asked. I got employee of the month, Pete said. He slightly smiled, but he shook his head. That's great, I said. Yeah, he said. Something bothering you? I asked. Pete didn't say anything for a minute. He wrapped his knuckles against the beer and stared at the bubbles. I'll tell you about it sometime, but not tonight. What did you want to see me about? I took a deep breath. It seemed so easy when I was thinking about this earlier, but now it isn't. That has to be the worst line imaginable to start a conversation. Try again, Pete said. I want to tell you something, but it's hard, I said. Why is it hard? We've known each other for years and shoot hoops almost every weekend. Have you ever been in love and you know it won't work out and they never know about how you feel, but you love them anyway, I said. You don't make any sense tonight. It sounds like you're talking about a high school crush, Pete said, and took a sip from his beer. Do you remember Melissa from high school? The girl in English, I said. At least we were sort of on topic. Somehow, I had to find the courage. This was more nerve-wracking than my first time behind the wheel of the rig. That's the ambulance I drive. I crushed on her hard, and I never said anything, Pete said. I almost failed English because I kept dreaming up ways of asking her out. Can you imagine me being so scared that I never even talked to her? I remember her, I said. How many times did you tell me that she was your one and only? About 50,000, Pete said. Did you know she went down to Vegas to study fashion design? What would you do if she walked in that door right now, I asked. Nothing. Last I heard she got married and had a kid, Pete said. So, Ethan, old friend, you've fallen in love with someone and can't tell them. Since I know most of the people in your life, it must be someone at work. Is it that lady you drive with? Tia, I said. No, she's ten years older than me, 
married and has a 10-year-old boy and an 8-year-old girl. It's not her. My best friend has fallen in lust, Pete said, smiled, and nodded. He took a sip of his beer before he said anything. Ethan, word of advice. Office romances are complicated and messy, especially when you fall out of love. How long have you been in love? Years, I said. I ran my hands around the beer, feeling the coolness and wetness. It's not somebody I work with. Then who, Pete said. The moment of truth. I stared at the beer, then at my best friend. One word would tell him everything in my soul. You. Pete stared at me, eyebrows lowered, and his mouth frowned. He suddenly smiled. He must think it's a joke. Ethan, are you serious, Pete said. That's what you wanted to tell me? I nodded. I mean it. I fell in love with you years ago. You're in love with me, Pete said. He took a sip of his beer, and when he set it down, he leaned forward, elbows resting on the table. Let me back up. I'm gay. I should have told you a long time ago how I felt, I said, trying hard to read Pete's face. Since when? Pete asked. Was that an accusation? I'm just being paranoid. Relax. How long have you known? Pete said. I figured it out back in middle school, but I didn't have the courage to tell anybody for a long time, I said quietly. I don't know what was so interesting about the table, but that's all I stared at. Pete didn't look at me, only at his beer. He slowly rotated his mug, then took another sip. My best friend is gay, and he's in love with me, Pete said. You really mean this, don't you? You're really gay. I was hoping we could talk about it. Maybe I could take you out sometime, I said. I ran my finger up and down the cold mug, staring at the foam cap, at the napkin underneath slowly getting soaked. Wait a minute. You're gay, you're in love with me, and you want to take me out, Pete said. Something about the way he said it made it sound like a list of criminal offenses. I gave my best friend a small smile and almost reached for his hand. I stopped myself and instead held my mug. I know it sounds weird. I crushed on you hard back in our senior year, but I was too afraid to say anything, I said. You should have said something, Pete mumbled. Just like you said something to Melissa, I said. That's different, Pete said, getting out of his seat. He wasn't smiling or frowning. I couldn't read him. You're right, Ethan. I guess it's not that much different. Excuse me a minute. Pete headed to the jukebox and read over the selections. Whatever reaction I had expected from my best friend, I didn't expect him to withdraw. A small, slow ache formed in my chest, and I bit my lip. Maybe he only needed time to process what I said? I should have said something years ago, but I was comfortable with how we were. I hoped Pete had already figured it out, and we didn't have to talk about it. I guess... It had been a surprise. Had I just ruined our friendship? Pete punched a couple of selections into the jukebox, then turned his back to me and walked to the rear of the pub, towards a small corridor that led to the restrooms and the rear door. Was I wrong to tell Pete how I felt? Was I wrong to tell Pete I was gay? Tia, my partner, had figured out I was gay the first day I drove with her, and she didn't care. She had even suggested I talk to Pete. She said he'd understand. The guys at the fire station didn't care. The chief didn't care. I was with the guys 24 hours every three days, and we knew everything about each other. We trusted each other because we had to. One of the guys, Officer Lopez, one of the policemen we worked with, even asked me how to talk to his teenage son because they couldn't connect. His son was gay. My parents hadn't known until I told them when I was a junior back at Montgomery Memorial. That was the weirdest and worst day of my life because it changed everything. The rear door opened, letting a slight breeze in. Pete had walked out of the pub. I guess I had my answer. Pete walked out on me. I guess Tia was wrong about my best friend. So was I. The loneliness stung and a warmth filled my eyes. 
I wasn't hungry anymore. I left enough money on the table to cover dinner, even though our meals hadn't arrived, and left by the front door. I had told the man I had loved for years that I was gay, and I loved him. Pete snuck out the back and left. Tia was wrong about Pete. Tonight didn't just sting, it hurt bad. Time to binge eat triple chocolate cheesecake brownies and mocha fudge ice cream. At least my dog never walked out on me. Good thing I was on shift tomorrow because I didn't want to think or feel. Thank you, everybody, for joining me. I appreciate it. We'll see you next week. Peace.